Thanks very much. Um, well, the one-day conference to honour Dr. Anna Bonus Kingsford on the 100th anniversary of her death for the 22nd of February is a wonderful opportunity to cast light on her life, on her occult scholarship, and on Edward Maitland. I think you have um, face. Oh, sorry, yes, I'm facing all that way. Right, yes. Quick picture of things on the Yes, right, yes, yes. Um, and the conference has been titled That Remarkable Series, a title which, according to A.P. Sinnott, was given by Kuthumi Mahatma after he had read The Perfect Way uh, in, after it was published in 1882. Although I note that Edward Maitland had referred to Anna Kingsford as the series in his own 1877 book, The Soul and How It Found Me. Um, the Perfect Way or the Finding of Christ, to give its full title, was written by two people, not one. Its authors are Dr. Anna Bonus Kingsford and Edward Maitland. And of course, many of you have heard of Anna Kingsford, but few know much about Edward Maitland. Both were in the public eye in the late 19th century through their public campaigns for vegetarianism and against vivisection. And they were also very well known within esoteric and spiritualist circles. I shall start with their biographies up to the time that they first collaborated in 1875 and then delve into their friendship and how it was that their psychic and spiritual collaboration produced some of the best esoteric literature of their time and contributed immensely to the great occult revival of the late 19th century. I'll begin with Edward Maitland, the unknown one so to speak, and you will see how the esoteric ideas that he formulated before he met Anna were actually crucial to their collaborative works in the 1880s. Um, Yes. Edward Maitland was born on the 27th of October 1824 in Ipswich, but was brought up in Brighton, where his father was a notable and respected strict evangelical preacher, Bible basher. Um, Edward graduated from Cambridge University and was expected by his family to be ordained, but he had nagging doubts about his own faith and also the state of organised religion. He asked for time to think about that vocation in life and failing to find an answer, took a steamship to the Americas. He went to Gold Rush, California, and became one of the band of 49ers in that country. Maitland eventually arrived in Australia. He became a sheep farmer, and he married Esther. However, he was left a widower with a small son just over one year later. He and his son returned to England, in 1857, where he made a very meagre living writing magazine articles and novels. But his first novel, The Pilgrim and the Shrine, or Passages from the Life and Correspondence of Herbert Ainsley, was published in 1869. It is a thinly disguised autobiographical work. The wife in this novel is called Mary, which is significant, for Mary became his secret and very private name for Anna Kingsford later. Edward Maitland had sailed south to California, just as the main character in the novel Ainsley did. And on this voyage, Ainsley, i.e. Maitland, meets a fellow traveller known just as the Frenchman. The Frenchman appears to have an acquaintance with the ancient mythologies to a remarkable extent, and regards Christianity as but a refined pagan eclecticism. The Frenchman also states that when people investigate the history and composition of the Bible, it is adieu to Christianism. Algernon and Anna Kingsford both enjoyed this book, and Anna is in total sympathy with Herbert Ainsley. Early formulations of Maitland's later theories are found in various discussions within this novel and expanded in his later works. At some period, Edward Maitland returned to Brighton to care for his widowed mother. He was in the process of writing an epistolary book, the book The Keys of the Creeds, during 1873 and 1874, in which he hoped to reveal that the intended sense of both the Bible and Christianity were as keys to help mankind discern and realise the divine potentialities within each human. Both Anna Kingsford and Edward Maitland had articles about their fictional stories, which, and the articles were published in The Examiner in the summer of 1873, and this set off a flurry of letters between the pair. 
they found out that Edward Maitland and the Reverend Kingsford had family connections of some sort, and this would have been a good enough reason to allow for further correspondence. In the keys of the creed, there is also the first intimation of the importance of striving for the perfect, which was to permeate their joint work later as they embraced Neoplatonic teachings that showed the way in which the soul could be perfected and return to the eternal and supreme. The fall occurred as man became conscious of the fact that, as Edward states, his real does not equal the ideal he is able to imagine. He goes on to point out that humanity must produce a new Adam whose real shall coincide with the ideal before it can claim to be a true incarnation of God. It is here too that Edwards first moots the idea of atonement as being at one or reconciliation between man and God and the notion of Christ as a manifestation of the perennial solar resurrection God. As Edward puts it, this book is mainly interpretative and consequently reconciliatory. It aims at making at one meant between mind and heart by bringing together mercy, which he saw as religion, and truth, that is, science. Edward Maitland, much in advance of his contemporaries, believed in the equality of the sexes and envisaged the Virgin Mary of the Catholic Church in the light of the solar myth gods. In the solar myths, there is invariably a mother of the solar god, designated the Queen of Heaven. This powerful goddess is usually symbolised by the moon. He also saw this female half of God, as previously personified in Syria and Greece, as the virgin Ashtoreth in Diana, or Phoebe, the feminine of Phoebus. In the male-dominant world of the Victorians, this was very innovative, and when Anna Kingsford pursued this notion, she elevated the female to the higher principle of the monad. Um, Edward Maitland composed the keys of the creeds as epistles or letters. They were not addressed to Anna, for it seems to be purely a literary device. The extent to which Edward Maitland influenced Anna Kingsford is unexpected, but so many of the themes found in their joint work are also within this solo book. For example, it includes the two trinities, male and female, the self-created devil or Satan. For if man creates God in his own image, likewise idealising and personifying his worst, man creates the devil, also in his own image, but the image of his worst. Remarkably, every single one of the threads running through the keys of the creeds were in fact taken up later and expounded by Kingsford and Maitland together. Edward shows a Christian theosophy which sought to reveal the universal truth by finding the perennial philosophy that united all the world's religions. He traces the origins of the bi biblical genesis to India with Brahma as the original self-existent being who initiated creation. This creation myth travelled westwards to Persia and the Jews acquired their Genesis account from there. If India is the birthplace of religion, this would account for the pair's acceptance of Madame Helena Blavatsky's teachings when they first joined the Theosophical Society, even though they had some reservations about the Mahatmas. It was indeed at the instigation of Algernon, Edward's, Anna's husband, that Anna and Edward finally met in the flesh in 1874, when the two of them experienced a great spiritual rapport during his first, of many, stays at the Shropshire Parsonage. Maitland was considered by Algernon to be the best person to chaperone his wife Anna for her registration as a student of medicine in Paris. This had to be done in the April 1874. And so a few weeks after the visit to the Shropshire Parsonage, he received the letter from Algernon asking him if he would accompany his wife for the enrolment. Anna Kingsford acted as a final editor for Edward's book, The Book the Keys of the Creeds, which was published anonymously in 1875. Edward Maitland's mother died in the summer of 1874, and so he was also able to accompany Anna for the start of her first term in Paris in the autumn of 1874, staying with her in a small apartment. 
She did not have to stay in Paris full-time for the full course of the study. She just had to attend at certain times, staying for several months and then continuing her studies privately back in England. Edward Maitland accompanied her there quite often, although Algen also took turns in taking her and the daughter Edith there too. Of course, as the studies progressed, more time was needed to be spent in Paris. I shall now turn to Anna Kingsford for a short biography of her life, up to the time she began her medical degree in Paris. She was born on the 16th of September 1846 in Stratford, Essex. It wasn't part of London then. Um, and she was the asthmatic youngest child of a wealthy middle-class family. Her father was a shipbroker of Italian descent, and her mother had Irish and German antecedents. Her brothers were much older than her. Her eldest brother, John Bonus, a doctor, was 18 years older. The nearest sibling was her only sister, who was seven years older than her. She felt her childhood to be somewhat lonely. She spent a lot of time in the garden or in her father's library. This, by the way, was a typical middle-class girl's education at the time, but as her father had a good library, it was a good self-education. She wrote poetry and short stories from a precociously early age, some of which were published, Beatrice, A Tale of the Early Christians, aged 13, and a book of poems, River Reads, in 1866, aged 16. She was sent to a finishing school in Brighton from her mid-teens, and it was there that she first became interested in spiritualism. Anna Bonus attended her first formal seance in 1867, where she was introduced to spiritualism and received a message purportedly from her deceased father, to the effect that there was life after death and to resist materialistic teachings. In a following seance with the same medium, the spirit of Anne Boleyn wrote to Anna Bonus as a long-lost relative. It was through spiritualism that her interest in esotericism began. Spiritualism had crossed the Atlantic from the United States to Britain and Europe around the middle of the 19th century and soon became in vogue in all classes of society. Middle-class spiritualism, centred in London, was not opposed to Christian belief and had its own social agenda that included protesting against vivisection, capital punishment and alcohol use. So it was probably through such spiritualist circles that Anna began her vegetarianism and her anti-vivisection campaigns. When her father died in 1865, Anna had received an inheritance that had provided a healthy income of about £750 per annum. As she approached 21, she began to feel pressurised by her family to consider suitable marriage suitors. She rebelled. She eloped and married a cousin, not a blood cousin, um, and she married Algernon Kingsford on the 31st of December 1867, but only after she had extracted the promise of complete freedom to pursue her own life throughout and within the marriage a promise which he scrupulously kept, and she helped pay his way through theological college to become an ordained clergyman. Exactly nine months after the honeymoon, a daughter, Edith, was born, and I think we can say safely that Anna Bonus Kingsford's relations with Algernon were strictly non-sexual after the honeymoon. <laughs> um, Anna converted to Roman Catholicism to avoid the duties of being a Church of England vicar wife. She be, and because also she did enjoy the Roman Catholic devotional practice of Marianism. She longed for a more satisfying church service and spiritual atmosphere, and not surprisingly found them in Roman Catholicism, to which she had been beckoned by an apparition purporting to be that of the St. Mary Magdalene. She took the name Mary Magdalene when formally received into the Catholic Church in 1870. At the same time, though, she did keep up her spiritualist connections, for after her marriage, she was given messages from time to time by an Anna Wilkes concerning her future medical study, and Anna Wilkes is then hailed as a prophetess by Anna Kingsford. During the next few years, she wrote novels, she owned and edited a women's magazine, it wasn't very successful, mostly because she stopped the adverts. <laughs> <laughs> she, um, she lectured and campaigned on vegetarianism, anti-vivisection, votes for women, and women's dress reform. 
but eventually she decided in 1874 that she had to begin a medical degree course to add gravitas to her anti-vivisection arguments. It was just at this point that she and Edward Maitland began their collaboration on esoteric Christian theosophy, and so it was most convenient that Edward was able to assist and chaperone Anna as she started her Parisian medical studies. And this is how Edward Maitland saw the task. Right. In reviewing um, the situation, I found myself conscious of a feeling that I had somehow contracted a responsibility of no ordinary kind towards her. For I foresaw that, while we should become great friends, there was that in her which rendered her peculiarly amenable to personal influences, notwithstanding her claim to independence of character. I felt, too, that thus far it was altogether uncertain how or to what extent her revolt against conventional ideas would find expression. Intensely feminine of aspect, fragile of frame and delicate of constitution, she was evidently endowed with energy and talents sufficient to ensure conspicuous results. Of her possession of the other qualities essential to high achievement, patience, perseverance, discretion and judgment, I was less confident. She struck me as one so liable to be possessed and mastered by her ideas, rather than to possess and master them, as to be in danger of losing sight of all collateral considerations. The position of Edward Maitland as author and Anna Kingsford as medical student and occasional essayist might have continued had it not been for a series of mystical illuminations received by both independently at first, then in unison, from 1876 onwards. It is in the hotbed occult capital, Paris, that the pair began producing their synthesis of esoteric lectures and theories, all after 1876, as they united the radical new theory of reincarnation by French spiritiste Alain Kardec, and to an equally far-reaching exposition of esoteric biblical readings, inspired by Edward's Keys of the Creeds. They further added those theories to the occultism of Neoplatonist Thurgists and the Jewish and Christian Kabbalah. This synthesis was to show that the ancient mysteries are at the core of Christianity, and knowledge of these mysteries they claimed to have received by revelation using clairvoyant intuition. As Jocelyn Godwin has noted, both Anna and Edward were mediums, and this double mediumship together with a very close platonic relationship formed a unit on a higher plane. In itself, clairvoyant intuition was a far-reaching new way to use spiritualism, in that the communication appeared to come whilst the mind was still conscious. And, it's, and, and not losing consciousness of the self was to be the great difference between spiritualism and its mediums and the conscious interior communication between the different layers of a multi-layered monad employed by the theosophists, the mystics and the magicians of the late Victorian period. Um, the pair's belief in reincarnation came from the former spiritualists spiritualism which the French spiritists held and which they had learnt about in the Parisian spiritualist milieu. Alain Kardec, born Hippolyte Reval, founded spiritism in the 1850s in France. This was a popular form of Christian spiritualism, encouraged an anti-materialist attitude that appealed to Anna and Edward, with a caring, mutually beneficial socialism. It also promoted an interpretation of biblical and Jewish texts that, in fact, construed resurrection as meaning reincarnation. Kardec took the Martinist cosmology of the previous century from the writings of Louis Cord de Saint-Martin and essentially grafted this onto the imported American spiritualism to create his own syncretic spiritism. Martinism contained much to interest 19th century Christian occultists, such as Eliphas Levi, for it included Rosicrucianism, Hermetic mysticism, mingled with Christian mysticism, and a belief in supérieur inconnu. 
Anna Kingsford and Edward Maitland do not appear to have been fully on the esoteric scene in Paris in their first years in there, but later they had Paris resident Lady Caithness, that's Maria de, Ma de Maria Tegu, Duchess of Medina Pomar, as a friend. She directed a Christian inner circle and started a very independent theosophical society in Paris later. Lady Caithness was an admirer of spiritism. She'd read Kardec's theories, adopted reincarnation into her own philosophy. She personally translated and published Kardec's works into English, and she was convinced that when people read and studied spiritism, they too would accept reincarnation and Kardec's teachings would be vindicated. Anna and Edward first met Lady Caithness properly in 1878, and it would appear they gained as much from her as she did from them. It has often been thought that Lady Caithness was a follower of them. However, as early as 1876, she had written about reincarnation and of Christ as a sidereal spirit and as the guardian ruler of our planet in her book, Old Truths in a New Light. It was Lady Caithness, in fact, who introduced them to the works of Alephus Levi. That's Alphonse Louis Constant. She also lent the pair her Alephus Levi and Jacob Burma books. This led to Levi becoming a prime influence for Anna Kingsford's own belief system and her studying the Kabbalah. Lady Caithness also encouraged them not to reject the Theosophical Society out of hand and to be more open to its Eastern current. Before Anna met her, the only written spiritualist influence on her was Emanuel Swedenborg. The spiritualist connections of Anna Kingsford and Edward Maitland had a very strong bearing on their teachings, even though Anna stated that she had no occult powers whatever. She did not see herself as an ordinary clairvoyant at all, but simply as a prophetess, one who sees and knows intuitively, and not by any exercise of any trained faculty. This linking of mediumistic skills to being a prophetess came out of mesmerism from the previous century. Joanna Southcott had, through mesmerism, seen herself as a prophetess, the woman clothed with the sun, and as a female redeemer, announcing the second coming shortly to arrive. Anna Kingsford also associated herself with the woman of St. John's Revelations, and she too saw herself as a prophetess for a new age. Anna felt these mystical illuminations had come to her from her past memory and contained great spiritual truths concerning life and cosmic reality. From these illuminations, over a period of almost ten years, Anna and Edward began to gradually develop and extend their occult theories into their theosophy. Maitland, in the Keys to the Creeds, had already thought through the basic groundwork of their theosophy on an intellectual level, but it was Anna's personal spiritual revelations that affirmed those beliefs and added the theory of reincarnation, which was later taken to England and disseminated in their first Hermetic Lectures. At the beginning of 1876, Anna's health failed in Paris, and Edward was asked to accompany her on a trip to Italy to recuperate. It was in St. Marco's, Venice, that they both realised their ideal of higher pantheism. God, the world, and man makes all being divine. The distinctions are of condition, but everything is divine. They realised what in the spirit meant. When Anna had recovered enough to resume her studies in Paris, Edward returned to London. He found himself becoming more and more aware as a person and he had an illuminating experience of empathising with a large tree. The tree responded by quivering and then opening up to reveal its true inner being, vivid, luminous and distinct as a flash of silvery lightning. And he came to the conclusion that the same incorruptible spirit is in all things. Edward became ever more sensitive to spiritual psychic experiences. He was contacted by what he felt was a planetary spirit, and he found he could interpret Anna's vivid dreams. When in London one evening very late, Anna found she was doing automatic writing, which exactly took up the train of thought that Maitland had lost in his own lodgings 
round the corner that same night, though he admitted it was better expressed in Anna's writing. In this 1876 special year, Edward had an epiphany vision where he is able to ascend a vast spiral ladder going towards the centre of a system, his own system, the solar system and the universal system. The description he goes on to give tells me he was initiated into the cosmos. He himself describes it as a period of initiation. He understood it as an enhancement of power, physical and mental, and psychical. It was not in the least as if one were possessed, but as if the self, instead of partially animating the organism, the body, had descended into it in plenitude, completely suffusing it with the spirit. Edward further saw the complete duality of the Logos, male and female equal. In January 1877, Anna Kingsford moved to a new address in London, nearer to Edward, but also bringing her back into the spiritualist circle of Anna Wilkes. They were beginning to get a lot of messages from Esther, that's Edward's deceased wife, and from AZ, a shared genii. Since Anna's Venice illuminations of 1876, she and Maitland had been receiving spiritual messages called by Edward a cloud of witnesses through the Ouija board, wrappings, as well as dreams and visions. However, Anna did not become fully aware as an initiator of the cosmos until July 1877, back in Paris. She had been very ill, and Edward Maitland went there until Algernon could get away from his parish and over to France. Anna had an out-of-the-body experience and vision. She went into the universe and saw all the stars. She realised just how big the universe is. She felt she was dying and saw the major angels she passed the darkness and entered into the brighter regions where she saw Pallas Athena, then all the gods of Asia and the old gods of the northern lands. She later named this vision the vision of Adonai and God as a woman, Maria Aphrodite, Mother God. This event was Anna Kingsford's death and rebirth moment. Now both had been reborn and were initiates. Edward recalls that he had seen the outlines in his cosmic experience and now Anna's cosmic awakening showed the fullness of the detail. Edward Maitland decided that he was a member of the Church Invisible, not the Church Visible. After finishing his latest book, Edward decided to be nearer to Anna on a more permanent basis and the two became ever more psychically entangled with more and more frequent messages and illuminations leading to an explosion of them between March 1880 and January 1881. Originally, they felt they were receiving some of their spiritual guidance and inspiration from an ES, identified not long after as Emanuel Swedenborg. Anna did have mediumistic trance states and obtained revelations through intermediaries, relying on her intuitive faculties to distinguish whether her revelations came from higher sources or not. Her obvious ability to dream lucidly is exhibited by her conscious decision to revisit one of her inner guides, the 17th century astrologer magician William Lilly, in several full moon dreams. So one full moon and the next full moon she'd go back and carry on the conversation with William Lilly. It was around this time the pair increased their hermetic occult knowledge by studying Elephas Levi and quickly gained a grounding in astrology, alchemy, and the other hermetic arts, while they began to write sections which would become the perfect way and clothed with the sun. Anna felt that she received her writings, they were channeled, and she received her instructions from angels and spirits and her guides in her sleep, and she remembered them in great detail on awakening. When Anna finally became a doctor of medicine, uh, in 1880, she was then able to concentrate more of her time to the esoteric ideas and voices. She and Edward worked together on their writings in London, where she also had her professional doctor's practice. It mostly treated women. Um, by 1881, the pair had established evening discussion meetings. The attendees were mostly spiritualists, but some... Yes. Right, yes, but some um, 
I'll just play. Um, but, ah, yes, but some sundry members of the British Theosophical Society. Anna and Edward had read Isis Unveiled back in Paris. Charles C. Massey, Dr. George Wilde, and a whole host of other well-known theosophists came to these evening lectures in Chapel Street, which were followed by discussions. Many of these lectures were published in the perfect way. In Anna's introductory lecture, she stated that intuitional memory had been used to access and restore the doctrine of the pre-existence and perfectibility of the soul. She stressed that man has a fourfold rather than threefold nature, and this is symbolized by the four wheels of the cherubim, Ezekiel and the Apocalypse, which represented the four elements. Man is possessed of a fourfold nature, the material body, the fluidic perisoul or astral body, the soul or the individ of individual, and the spirit or divine father and life of the system. And the personal goal of existence is that divine marriage between soul and spirit, which occurs in the individual, constituting the final perfection or nirvana. She also used the idea of Alephus Levi's astral light theory, which contains masculine and feminine poles, rather like magnetic poles, and consisting of two opposing currents, the polarities of male and female in both the material and spiritual planes. She introduced the doctrine of reincarnation as the transmigration of the souls and used quotes from the divine Pimenda, Neoplatonic, and intimates that the progression and migration of souls and the power of man while still in the body to recover the recollections of his soul constituted the foundation of all those ancient religions out of which Christianity had its birth. The soul for her is the being that continues from reincarnation to reincarnation. Anna and Edward worked together, receiving and channeling numerous experiences. And at the British Museum Library, Anna learnt much more about Kabbalah and studied Annie Moses' History of Magic. She was becoming a magical practitioner and occultist as well as a spiritualist and esoteric Christian. The Perfect Way, having been published anonymously at first, attracted good reviews in the esoteric press and was enthusiastically praised by Christian spiritualists. There was some controversy in the pages of The Theosophist, a review by Sinnott, which criticized the fourfold theme of The Perfect Way, but it all smoothed over. Later, the pair traveled to Switzerland on the anti-vivisection crusade, where they first heard about the divisions within the London Theosophical Society. It was then mooted that perhaps they could lead a section of the Theosophical Society in London. Lady Caithness gave, as usual, the best advice, that they should just have their own society entirely separate from the Theosophical and take the Western esoteric into their society and leave the Theosophical Society to the Hindu Theosophists or the Himalayan Brotherhood. The th the Theosophical Society members in London feared a total collapse in England without Anna and Edward's help. The health of Anna's lungs, though, was already deteriorating. There were several severe asthma attacks, and she was determined to return to Paris for her occult studies. Why, as a Christian mystic, did she want to study occultism? Well, the answer was given to her higher being advisors. They said that the adept or occultist is at best a religious scientist, but not a saint. The saint has faith, the adept has knowledge, but the two are not in opposition. And so the advice was to take all the means at her disposal to know. But um, it is not obvious when first reading the biography of Anna Kingsford that, um, that Edward Maitland wrote, that there are any differences in their esoteric view and teachings. But Anna was extending her occult knowledge considerably and rejecting quite a lot of the spiritualist messages that Edward was still receiving when he attended seances. They were both grappling with the Eastern philosophies of the Theosophical Society, having finally be been persuaded to become president and vice president of the Theosophical in 1883, which is when they joined. That Anna wanted a universal East-West esoteric society is evident from her address given at a public reception for A.P. Sinnott 
on the th July the 17th, 1883. Anna stated that the word theosophy denotes the science of the divine, and she states the divine is our relationship to within, not to that which is without. It is to that which is in the heart of all being, the very core and vital point of our own true self. To know ourselves is, we hold, to know the divine. All of her teachings emphasize this point, know thyself. The pair saw the Theosophical Society movement as, as, as a movement to restore the mysteries and to unveil Isis. It was to become a society that invited earnest thinkers to examine the system and method of their all theological teachings from everywhere and satisfy themselves of their own true worth for the comprehension of esoteric religion. The study undertaken should not be just of old books, mythology and symbology, but also of living nature and the physical sciences. Anna ended her address with a blessing from Pallas Athena and acknowledged herself as a devotee of that goddess. Edward Maitland would still be regarded as a mystic Christian, not quite the pantheist that Anna had by this time become. Anna and Edward changed the name of the British Lodge to the London Lodge and later formed their own separate hermetic society within the Theosophical. But at the end of 1884, Anna and Edward formed a fully independent hermetic society. One example of the two minds working as one is from an episode at Acham Vicarage in Shropshire. It was an evening and Edward was working on the seven days of creation, Genesis, and the seven planets and the divinities assigned by Asaya to creation. He couldn't see why Venus was placed in fourth position with Earth in third position. Anna couldn't shed light on it either and the household went to bed. In the morning, Edward felt a light flashed on him, giving him a clue, and then just as he thought he'd been given an illuminating answer, the light went out and he couldn't catch the answer. He went to find Anna, but she was busy writing, and it was only when she put down her pen she read out to him the reason why Venus, or love, is mistress of the fourth day of creation after Dionysus, spirit of power, manifests as earth. Anna states it is because love, the soul, in fact must be perceived through a physical manifestation which can recognize love and the soul. This was the beginning of a much larger revelation which you'd find in Clothed with the Sun. It was received by Anna simultaneously as Edward nearly received it, the illumination had been diverted to Anna and she was the best to express it. Edward saw this as part of the grand design to exalt the woman as the spiritual representative of the soul and intuition. Shortly afterwards, Anna wrote a paean called the Hymn of Aphrodite and here are a few lines from it. There was no light on the ways of the earth the rolling world moved outward on her axe. Gloom and mystery shrouded the faces of the gods. Then from the deep I arose, dispeller of night, the firmament of heaven kindled with joy beholding me. And later on in the poem, But when the day star of the soul ariseth over the earth, then is the epiphany of love. Therefore, until the labour of the third day be fulfilled, the light of love is unmanifest. And this was how they bounced ideas off each other. They wrote together much of the time. Edward writes one sentence, the next would be Anna's. Although I suspect that Anna smoothed the whole manuscript over each time as she tended to do the editing. And Maitland's style was much more the product of Oxbridge. He writes in a Victorian gentleman's style. Anna's writing is much clearer, sticking closer to the point each time. The clarity of her writing makes it a joy to read. Anna continued to study oh. Anna continued to study the occult, turning her full attention to alchemy, and through that study read the 17th century book Astrology Theologized. 
she wrote an amazing and long preface for a reprint of the book, which she also translated. It sets out the pair's hermetic doctrine. Um, the soul of the astrological man theologized, divinized and affirmed in the likeness of God. The religious nature is added to the intellectual. The, facult the faculties of the man of science and the philosopher are completed by those of the saint, hence the rest of the seventh day. For whereas the achievements of the intellectual man are laborious, those of the spiritual man are inspirational, impulse, instinct, induction, inspiration. Such are the four stages of evolutionary ascent from the organic to the spiritual degree. The natural man strives and wrestles in order to achieve. The regenerate man rests in the Lord. However, there could be no rest for Anna and Edward, even though they could be classed as regenerated. Their fully independent hermetic society had a full program, which started with probably the most beautiful of her expositions, a lecture based on her introduction to the English translation from Dr. Maynard's French translation of The Virgin of the World, 1885, in which she examines the role of Corée Persephonea, the personified soul as the cosmic virgin, daughter of Zeus and Demeter, yet also mother of Dionysius' spirit. This lecture is a beautiful piece of writing and introduces the listener to Gnosticism, the idea of the soul being imprisoned in material conditions and the idea that until the soul falls into matter, the soul has no fate or karma. Anna asserts that the doctrine of karma is not just Hindu, its corollary in the West is fate, represented by the moon and the sevenfold astral spheres, with Artemis Isis as the benign aspect and Hecate as the malignant aspect. The esoteric lesson on the hermetic fragment of Kure Kuzmu is to understand the soul, for in all her forms she is both virgin and mother. In Isis she, she is initiatrix and enlightener. This lecture encapsulates the pantheism of Anna Kingsford, the acknowledgement of the role that demiurges and other manifestations of the divine, such as Isis in the role of Artemis or Hecate, can have an illuminating or controlling influence on the wandering soul until there comes her final recovery of generation and the return to the celestial abodes. The Hermetic Society was very successful and the list of speakers for the 1886 season includes two Masonic speakers who would become the founding members of the Golden Dawn, and they spoke on the Kabbalah. Anna gave a lecture with illustrations of her double triangle and her own depiction of the Seal of Solomon. Meanwhile, Edward Maitland gave a lecture on the revival of mysticism and another on symbology in the Old Testament. He was not an exponent of practical magic. The last lecture of the 1885 Hermetic Society series, also given by Anna, was called The Communi Communion of Saints, oh, that must be 86, and dealt with the process of the soul transcending to the highest level possible while still in the material mo body, the merging of the finite self with the infinite selfhood of deity. To achieve that objective, divine occult influence needs to be attracted and this is done by the use of will force. Anna Kingsford maintained that prayer was the most potent, subtle and concentrated form of will force, which, when exercised by souls whose whole energy is polarised and focused upon its employment, attains its f highest efficacy. You can see from this that Anna is thinking as a magician. Edward felt she had been overworked in that year, on top of her writing and talks, Anna had started a course of study in that most exhausting of all pursuits, practical occultism. Namely, she was having practical lessons in magic from Samuel McGregor Mathers, magician, Kabbalist, and master mason in directing will. She wanted to direct her magical will against the vivisectors of Paris. Pasteur was chiefly in her sights. Now, in her biography, 
Edward Maitland writes a long section on spiritual seances where Anna is confronted by all the spirits of her past lives. This would include Anne Boleyn, Mary Magdalene and others, none of whom make it to 40. And all these past life spirits are expecting her to die soon. Anna decides that she must take magical action against Louis Pasteur before she dies, and so off to Paris they go. Meeting en route with Madame Blavatsky in Ostend and staying there for a few days, they then went on to Paris, and in November 1886 they went to visit Louis Pasteur's institute. Pasteur was not there, and she and Edward got drenched in a sudden downpour on the way back to their lodgings. Anna caught pneumonia. She recovered slightly, but that, coupled with her asthma, had taken full toll on her lungs. Thereafter, she was advised by doctors that it was best to go to live in Egypt, or if not, to go to Italy as second choice. They left Paris with Edith and went to the south of France, and Algernon made his way there too, realising how ill she was. Baron Spediliari came to meet her, uh, but she was so ill he could only see Edward Maitland, but he gave Edward Maitland the precious letters written by Alephus Levi. Baron Spediliari is one of two um, acolytes, I suppose, of, of uh, Alephus Levi. Algernon had to return to his parish, and Edward and Anna went to Italy to stay until a house was made ready in London for Anna. And this is, I'm afraid, the end. <laughs> at, oh, nearly. At the end uh, of July 1887, they finally got to London, and Anna was virtually an invalid in the new home until she died there on the 22nd of February 1888. She had many dreams involving Palace Athena in the last month, and Edward, who had lodgings nearby, was with her much of the time. Her husband, Algy, came and went often. It is highly likely she died of tuberculosis, the euphemism being consumption. Uh, the only cure was fresh air, but Anna's lungs were too damaged, they were ruined. Her knight in shining armour was, of course, Edward Maitland. Anna called him Caro, and he loved her deeply in a courtly love way. She was unobtainable. He'd put her on a pedestal and worshipped her as the embodiment of pure womanhood. Edward Maitland regarded himself as a reincarnation of St John the Evangelist, and he had in this lifetime met once more with Mary Magdalene. It is only after Anna's death, in the posthumously published Clothes of the Sun, that the name of Anna Kingsford's personal daemon is revealed, Salethiel A.Z. Her daemon was closely connected to Edward Maitland's personal guide, A.Z. Salethiel is a genius who looks like Dante and also the angel of the power of prayer. If we see every person as a planet within their own personal solar system, we can understand the daemon more clearly. The genius or daemon is like the moon orbiting the planet, the person, the body. It has no light of its own, for it is a reflection of the divine spirit. The divine spirit is the internal solar system, the sun. It is the god of the man, the sun, that enlightens him. And Anna finally died on the 22nd of February, 1888. Um, and Edward Maitland was devastated by Anna's death. In her will, her writings and papers had been left to him. He posthumously published her writings, Dreams and Dream Stories, Clothed with the Sun, the story of Anna Kingsford and Edward Maitland and the New Gospel of Interpretation. Um, he founded the, uh, Edward then went on to found the Esoteric Christian Union in 1891 and wrote the two large volume biography Anna Kingsford, Her Life, Letters, Diary and Work, in 1896, it was published. He died in 1897, one year later. And the, but the Credo of Christendom was published a lot later in 1916. Clothes with the Sun was the most influential of the later books. They were successful, reaching most esoteric groups in Britain at the time. Unfortunately, after he had edited the other works for publication and written the biography, um, he retired to the countryside, he was ill, and he decided to have a large bonfire of all Anna's papers. Um, he died on the 2nd of October, 1897, 
there are, I, do, I don't know of any original manuscript documents by Anna Kingsford that are around, that have been left. Um, so that's that. <laughs> and so to recapitulate... Anna Kingsford and Edward Maitland were Christian hermeticists following Neoplatonistic and Hermes Trismegistos. They saw the main figures in the Jesus story as archetypes from within their own consciousness. Anna Kingsford did not claim that Christianity is the only true religion. She includes hymns to planetary deities. She regarded Christ as a principle of perfection within every person rather than a figure to atone for the sins of humanity. Edward saw atonement as being at one meant. In other words, forgive yourself and become one with the universe. She was a Kabbalist. She had extensively studied magic. She taught reincarnation theories and the channeling of intermediaries whilst retaining consciousness. They both realized the importance of connecting to one's personal genius, daemon, and to trust in one's higher intuition. They both lifted the feminine to spiritual heights. They did not just speak on esoteric and occult su subjects, they were actively campaigning for vegetarianism and against vivisection too. Anna practically, actively practiced magic and the use of magical will. Through the power of mediumship, she was able to contact not only intermediaries, intermediaries but her own genius, Salethiel and her mind was expansive enough to appreciate that it is the bond of union to the divine which is important, not just one particular religion or method of esoteric teaching. Anna was a superb speaker, inspiring large audiences. She was indeed justly named the Divine Anna by Madame Blavatsky. Her contribution to the Theosophical Society and to those magical orders and groups which were inspired by her has never been fully appreciated. Had it not been for her untimely death, age 41, she would have had far wider recognition today. Edward Maitland tried to get that recognition for her afterwards, and it succeeded for a while. But um, then it all died down, because she died early. Um, without the teachings of Anna Kingsford, I doubt there would have been a golden dawn. For she was the mysterious adept, Fräulein Sprengel. Anna Kingsford and Edward Maitland's contribution to Western esotericism and their influence upon the magical and mystical groups of the late Victorian period has been mostly ignored, in particular by those very groups that appeared to profit most from her theories. It's only now, finally in the 21st century, that the importance of their joint esoteric teachings are being acknowledged and revived. That's it. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. I hope I didn't go over... No, I didn't. Good. That's I, I hope I didn't...